If you've been following me for a while, you may know that I previously created two videos talking about the concept of negative mass. It's a strange and counterintuitive idea, but if you apply the rules of Physics 101 to it, it starts to make a sort of sense. I always intended to continue that series, but it stalled when my conceptual understanding at the time wasn't up to the task. Now I'm finally coming back to it. This video will wrap up the Physics 101 and 102 concepts that I didn't get to before, and I'll get to the real meat of the question with atomic physics later this summer. And go watch the first two negative mass videos now if you haven't already, otherwise this probably won't make much sense to you. We saw before that if you just plug negative masses into the equations of motion and see what happens, you get objects behaving in weird ways, speeding up when they should slow down, and sometimes accelerating off to infinity. Some commenters said this violates conservation of energy, because it would allow you to build a perpetual motion machine. But I don't think this is right. Yes, energy must be conserved, but it behaves differently when energy can be negative. If you have two particles of positive and negative mass where one chases the other, they can theoretically accelerate forever. But that doesn't generate energy from nowhere. Their total mass is zero, and that means their total kinetic energy also stays at a constant zero. Even if you could finagle it to draw energy from the positive particle, which I can think of ways to do, but it's trickier than it looks, it's more complicated than this diagram, but the trick is that the negative particle's energy is still growing, becoming more and more negative. If you do manage to get perpetual motion, it will only be because the negative mass gives you an infinite well of potential energy to draw on with its own energy infinitely decreasing in exchange, and that allows it to balance out in the end. So conservation of energy seems to be safe, but could other forces derail our negative mass model? Friction forces look especially suspect for this weird behavior. Friction is usually represented as a force between two surfaces pointing opposite the direction of motion, which is proportional to the normal force from resting on the surface. Since negative mass moves in the opposite direction to the forces on it, friction should make a negative mass speed up. But not so fast. I argued in the last video that when you have a negative mass resting on the ground, at least if you model the ground as a single large object, the gravitational and normal forces are reversed. The gravitational force points up, while the normal force points down. Since the normal force is reversed, it stands to reason that the friction force could also be reversed to point forward along the direction of motion. And since negative mass moves opposite to the forces on it, it would slow down. But that's just the Physics 101 version, the intuition that we hope to back up at a deeper level. The real physics behind it is more complicated. To paraphrase my earlier statements, friction forces aren't magic. They're caused by normal forces. Two objects rubbing against each other are never perfectly smooth. On the micro scale, they have bumps and divots that catch on one another and push directly against each other, and that is what's causing the friction. Now we can apply our model of reversed normal forces directly. The normal forces on the negative block within the friction force are directed net forward, and that means the block will accelerate backwards, slowing down. So this does fit our Physics 101 model, and friction works normally. But now we may have another problem with energy. When a positive mass block slows down through friction, it loses kinetic energy, which is lost as sound and heat but a negative mass block has negative kinetic energy, and when it slows down, it becomes less negative. It has to gain energy. Where does this energy come from? Does it have to absorb heat from the system to slow down? I don't have a conceptual basis to prove this, but I think the answer will be yes, 
Endothermic processes are possible in nature. Cold packs work by endothermic chemical reactions that absorb heat. Compressed gas that expands adiabatically winds up colder than the surrounding air. I think it can work. The important thing is that the energy still balances out. On the other hand, there's another kind of friction that we need to worry about. Drag forces. Drag is caused by an object moving through a fluid, where the fluid pushes against the direction of motion. This applies in both air and water, but let's use air because then we can use the kinetic theory of gases and look at individual molecules. Under normal physics, drag in air is caused by elastic collisions of air molecules with the moving object. If you crunch the numbers, randomly moving molecules bouncing off a moving object will bounce forward along its motion. This gives the air a net forward motion, and since momentum is conserved, it has to have robbed the block of some of its forward momentum, slowing it down. We learned in part one that if a small positive mass collides elastically with a larger negative mass, the negative mass will bounce forward. In other words, a negative mass loses momentum the same as a positive mass, but its momentum is already negative, so it speeds up. Energy still balances out here. The block's kinetic energy becomes more and more negative, and the difference goes into heating the air around it, just like a positive mass but the direction of acceleration is reversed. And this looks kind of contradictory. With negative masses, solid friction behaves normally, but fluid friction is reversed. And this actually comes back to the results for relative sizes of blocks in part two. If the positive mass is the larger one, like the ground in solid friction, normal forces are reversed, and things behave close to normally. But if the positive mass is the smaller one, like air molecules in fluid friction, you get this weird inverted behavior. However, since solid objects are ultimately made of atoms themselves, this is a problem that we're going to have to solve with atomic microphysics in part 4. But before that, there's one more Physics 101 problem I want to talk about, which I hinted at earlier. Gravity. Gravity is weird with negative mass because you have to plug in the negative sign twice. Remember that we're assuming Einstein's equivalence principle, that inertial mass and gravitational mass are the same. Gravity normally pulls down, and a negative mass that is pulled down should fall up. but the negative mass also has negative gravitational mass, which means the gravitational force flips direction. Gravity pushes up on a negative mass, which makes it fall down. The thing is, is it that weird to have this double negative? Gravity seems to stand out among the forces at first because it reverses direction when the mass is negative, resulting in a non-inverted acceleration. But we just saw that friction forces do reverse direction when mass is negative, and that makes them behave more normally too. And one step back up the chain, normal forces at least sometimes reverse direction when mass is negative. Maybe this is how forces on negative masses operate. In fact, that would solve another puzzle from part two. What about elastic forces? In part two, I only used positive springs attached to positive masses because the spring model failed with negative masses. You may recall that if we attach a negative mass to a spring, it stretches exponentially. This still works with conservation of energy because with a bit of calculus you can show that the positive elastic potential energy and the negative kinetic energy stay in lockstep but it would also apply to elastic forces within a negative mass object, which would suggest that negative mass objects would simply disintegrate under elastic forces, as the forces try to push them through themselves. 
However, from what we've learned here, it seems the solution would be to do what we've done with the other forces and reverse the direction. Evidently, a negative mass spring needs to have a negative spring constant. So it pushes away from equilibrium, and its own negative mass pulls it back towards equilibrium. A negative spring will oscillate under a negative load and stretch exponentially under a positive load, the opposite of a positive spring. I don't have a conceptual justification for this part either, except that the math works out. It's the only way to make the collisions in part 1 make sense with real forces. But it's still a physics 102 model where solid objects just do what they do. Once again, these mechanical forces aren't magic. They're caused by electrons in atoms pushing against one another. Thus, we've once again come to the physics of negative mass atoms. This is something I've struggled with for a long time, but I've recently had a breakthrough, and I think I know how to make them work. So you can consider this video a sneak preview for a certain math video contest that's coming up soon. The definitive negative mass part 4 will finally answer all of these questions. I hope. Subscribe to get notified when it comes out, and also see the other videos I've got in the works.